Hello, my name is Vitaly Kutaryansky and I'm professor of formulation science at Regin School of Pharmacy. I started working for Regin School of Pharmacy since 2005, so it was from the very beginning of uh, the school. I'm not a pharmacist, I'm a chemist by training and I teach drug delivery and uh, pharmaceutical materials. This lecture will be focused on transmucosal drug delivery, which I teach partially in year 2 and partially in year 3. And transmucosal drug delivery covers mucosal surfaces in our body, and this includes oromucosal drug delivery when uh, the drug is getting absorbed from, from the oral cavity. Uh, then uh, nasal drug delivery, which is uh, drug delivery via nasal cavity. Then uh, oral or gastrointestinal drug delivery, where the drug tr uh, is swallowed and it travels through the gastrointestinal tract then ocular delivery uh, and uh, vaginal, rectal and intravesical drug delivery. All of these are mucosal services and intravesical is drug delivery to urinary bladder. Uh, what is important to know about these routes of drug administration, of transmucosal drug administration, is the dynamic nature of mucosal services. So, the mucosal surfaces, even though they are different in different parts of our body, they have some similarities, but the main uh, feature of, of these surfaces is their dynamic nature. For example, the uh, mucosal surfaces in the airways, uh, the epithelia, they are coated with tiny hairs called cilia, and the cilia, they are continuously moving, they are beating in a coordinated fashion. And what is sitting on the top and within this cilia is the layer of mucus. Mucus moves by cilia beating and uh, the function of this mucus is to trap particles. When we breathe air, we uh, basically have particles of dust, particles of uh, bacteria and viruses, any other particles. They're getting uh, trapped by the mucus and they're being moved and moved by the process of mucociliary clearance, uh, which means that um, the, uh, these particles are eliminated from the airways and they go, when we, we swallow them and they go to our stomach uh, where they're neutralized by the acidity in the stomach. And this is a cont continuous process. Uh, during the day, uh, we produce around uh, from 500 to 1 liter, 500 milliliters to 1 liter of mucus, which we eventually swallow. Another example of dynamic surface is the ocular tissue, and you could see this animation uh, that shows the process of nasal lacrimal drainage when the tears, they are produced by the lacrimal gland, and they are continuously irrigating the ocular surface and they uh, go into the lacrimal duct and uh, eventually they will go into our mouth. Those of you who have ever experienced applying eye drops, you possibly will remember that whenever you apply eye drops, you will immediately uh, sense the, the drug in the mouth. And that is related to uh, the nasal lacrimal drainage. So mucosal surfaces are highly dynamic, which is good for us because it helps to protect our body, but at the same time is not good for drug delivery because it uh, prevents the drug molecules from getting, um, getting absorbed where they are needed. And uh, it was demonstrated some time ago that the dosage forms that stick to mucosal surfaces are believed to improve drug delivery because when they stick to mucosal surfaces or uh, these dosage forms will be called muco adhesive, they facilitate longer residence time on mucosal surfaces so the drug molecules could have a better chance to get released from the dosage form and to get absorbed by the mucosal epithelia. And there's a number of uh, commercial examples of sticky or mucoadhesive dosage forms. For example, there are several mucoadhesive tablets, for example, buccal tablets. Uh, there are some films that are typically applied in oral cavity and they, these films are sticky. They could be uh, attached to the buccal membranes or to the tongue. 
Then um, some mucoadhesive dosage forms are applied in ocular drug delivery, such as mucoadhesive eye drops or gels. Also, there are some cough syrups, uh, which have uh, mucoadhesive components in their uh, composition, and this will help us to relieve the irritation in the airways because of the stickiness of this polymer. And also the product like Gaviscon, uh, and Gaviscon is formulated as several types of products, both as liquid formulations and as tablets. And within Gaviscon, there's mucoadhesive components that could stick to our uh, gast uh, parts of gastrointestinal system, to esophageal part, and they could uh, protect it from the acidity of the stomach. Mucoadhesive dosage forms could be prepared from formulations containing sticky polymers, and these polymers are typically soluble in water. This may include some natural polymers, such as sodium carboxymethyl cellulose, derived from cellulose, or chitosan, which is prepared from exoskeleton of crustaceans. Alternatively, some synthetic polymers could be used, such as polyacrylic acid, or more complex system called Eudrogid EPO, which is manufactured by the German company called Evonik. And these polymers could be used to uh, formulate various dosage forms. The simplest dosage form will be a tablet, for example, mucoadhesive tablets that could be uh, prepared by compressing uh, the powders of uh, polymers, composed of polymers. Then uh, this could be also formulated as solutions uh, containing mucoadhesive polymers or so-called in situ gen systems, the systems that will stay as solutions before the administration into the body. For example, when they are sitting in the fridge at uh, plus five degrees, they will be transparent solutions. Once they are administered uh, to the body, for example, as an eye drop, then the temperature will change to the body temperature and uh, the polymer will turn into a gel. So that would what is called in situ gelling system. Alternatively, the polymers could be formulated as soluble films. These films could be used in ocular drug delivery. When they are placed on the eye, they stick to the ocular surface and they gradually dissolve, releasing the drug. Or uh, there's a number of nano formulations, uh, so called nano containers, that could be formulated using uh, mucoadhesive polymers. And this could also have the drug incorporated. They could stick to mucosal tissues where they are administered and gradually re release the drug. When mucoadhesive dosage forms are developed, they always need to be tested. In particular, we need to evaluate their adhesive properties. And in order to do that, we normally use experiments, so-called ex vivo experiments, when we take the uh, mucosal tissue from animals, for example, pig mucosal tissue from the local abattoir. And then we use a method that is called tensile test. This test is applicable for testing the adhesive properties of tablets. And for these uh, experiments, we use a technique that is called uh, the instrument that is called text analyzer. Uh, on a mobile probe of this text analyzer, we attach our mucoadhesive tablet. Then we use the pig tissue, pig cheek, for example, as a substrate. And then we place the tablet in contact with this substrate, leave it for a few seconds, and then uh, lift the probe up and uh, measure the force required to detach the probe. So basically the instrument helps us to record this curve uh, by measuring the force as a function of distance between the probe. And uh, we calculate two parameters. We calculate the uh, maximum force required to detach the tablet and also the area under this curve, which is the uh, total work of adhesion. In order to test uh, the retention of liquid formulations on mucosal surfaces, we use a special channel and we place uh, a freshly excised animal mucosal tissue into this channel. For example, for testing the retention of eye drops, we use bovine conjunctival tissue and we 
replace our formulation, which is spiked with a special fluorescent dye called sodium fluorescein. We place this formulation on the top of this tissue. And then we uh, wash this formulation with artificial tear fluid. And we monitor the progress uh, with the fluorescent microscope and we take lots of images and uh, these images show how well each formulation will help us to retain sodium fluorescein. And then we convert these images using image analysis into numerical values and then we analyze these numerical values and show uh, which formulation is better. For example, the formulation in yellow, it does show better retention compared to the formulation in green. We also need to perform some toxicological testing for our formulations. For example, when we're developing eye drops, when uh, we, we need to test ocular irritation, and there's a number of techniques we use. One of the techniques is uh, in vivo techniques using slugs. And slugs, they release mucus in response to irritation. So when you place slug on an, a surface that is irritant, you could see that uh, they release lots of uh, yellow colored mucus. When the slug is sitting on a surface that is safe for them, then they don't release much mucus. We also have uh, developed, uh, have adapted the industrial tests that is called bovine opacity and permeability test when we use freshly excised bovine eyes and we'll look at how they could damage, how different chemicals could damage the corneal surface. Uh, additionally, what we could do, we could uh, look at histological images of the eyes exposed of the, again, of freshly excised eyes exposed to different irritants and different compounds we are testing. And we could look at the structure of the epithelium. And finally, we recently developed a new test. Uh, it has never been reported before. It is, uh, we call it planaria fluorescent assay when we use the flat worms called planaria and we uh, expose them to, the, uh, to our formulations and we look how much damage this formulation could cause to planaria. In addition to the use of planaria in toxicological studies, these organisms are also of interest in pharmacological research. We've been using planaria in the studies of psychoactive drugs such as haloperidol and the effects of various pharmaceutical excipients. Planaria is a free-living flatworms. They could move in water by beating cilia. The patterns of their movement could change dramatically in the presence of some psychoactive molecules. We have established that the mobility of planaria in the presence of haloperidol is substantially reduced similarly to the effect of this drug on mammals. We hope to develop this model as a pre-screening tool for new psychoactive molecules before tests are performed in mammals. I hope you enjoyed this video and it gave you a good idea about what I teach in different parts of M-Farm program at Trading School of Pharmacy. If you'd like to learn more about these topics, you could sign up for my research channel on YouTube and you could watch some videos related to my research.